وصف الأنين بداخل كم مرة قد ذاق قلبي من أسى محلته وكم كرهت مصابها لكن رأيت الخير يسكب في أنا كم مرة قد ذقت من عظم البلاء بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Since I uploaded that video about a week ago, <laughs> there's been you know a a, a panic uh, from the uh, waste paper of the rulers or the madakhla or the super salafis to that matter. Uh, you know, writing responses to me and, you know, highlighting uh, or sending me a link of such and such scholar or, you know, articles, etc. Uh, and one particular uh, video uh, was brought to my attention. Now, whether this video was in response to me or whether this was just a general uh, response um, from uh, Sheikh Al Fawzan, um, you know, I'll play the video, but it just highlighted obviously how high. Uh, and <laughs> how much they they went into panic mode when the when the video came out. Now this video will cover so much different avenues or different angles. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually dwell into the book itself. Okay, we're going to look at the transmission. So what I'm going to do is the actual maktoutat. We're going to look at the manuscripts and go through the actual riwayat al-kitab, the actual train of transmission of the kitab, and we'll look at the authors. Whereas in the last video, what I did was I just basically pulled out the name of Ghulam Khalil from the title of the manuscript and the second page, which was the riwayat al-kitab. So that's what I'm going, to, I'm going to do. But now I'm not going to look at that straight away. I'm going to focus on the actual book itself. Because what we're going to do is there's our position and our premise is this. Either one. It's been wrongly ascribed to Ghanam Khalil and Barbahari in fact wrote the book. And if that is the case, then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the book itself. So we're going to dwell into the book as well. Okay, we're going to dwell into the book and basically query. Okay, if that's the case and you're ascribing to, to, to this book to Barbahari, then that's a problem as well. Because there's so much issues in the book. Now we're going to really make it detailed and extensive. So that's one avenue of it. If it was either wrongly ascribed to Ghulam Khalil, so Barbahari wrote it. Number two is that Ghulam Khalil actually appropriated and changed aspects of the book to suit, you know, his beliefs or to appease the Abbasid government at the time. Now you must be thinking, what do you mean by that? Don't worry, when we get into the video, you'll see. And what we're going to do also is there's certain problematic statements in the book and riwayats that he's presented if it's in fact from Barbahari because when we present all of these statements we're going to ask the following questions either it was written by al-Barbahari which means that there's some issues with Barbahari and obviously certain statements and positions and his life as well we're going to go into his life and we're going to say well hold on here this was his life this was this was his positions in his life and this is what's written in the book doesn't add up. Do you understand what I mean? It doesn't add up. So his actual life and how he was as a person, you know, a rebel, a muscular sort of Hanbali, and what he's put in the book doesn't make any sense. So without, it, without going into further uh, elaboration, let me play the video of Sheikh Al Fawzan. Whether this video was in actual response to me, I don't know. But let's listen to his response uh, where a question asks him about those doubts in Shadda Sunnah or those who have doubts about the book because of a certain said someone. Let's have a listen. Sallallahu alaykum sahib al-fadila wa hadha sa'in yaqool Hunaka man shakakani fi nisbati hadha al-kitab sharhi al-sunnati lil-imam al-barbahari wa yaqool wa innahu lam yathbut nisbatuhu ilayhi tarikhiyan fahal kalamuhu sahih Hala wa shidriha an al-tarikh wa shidriha an hala jahal al-murakkab yani ma yathak bil-ulama an liathbitaw hadha ولا يثق شيخ الاسلام بن تيميه نقل منه نقل منها من هذه الرساله في في فتاواه يعني نكذب الائمه ونصدق هذا وش يدري هذا وش يعرفه بالتاريخ وبحياه العلماء هذا جهل مركب وربما يكون في نفسه شيء على هذه العقيده ما يريد شكك الناس فيها القران ايضا قالوا ما هو بكلام الله تعجبون ما في من قال ان القران ما هو بكلام الله يعني عاجز أحد يقول إن هذا الرسالة ما ما هي بكلام البربهاري ما يعجز نعم 
Sheikh Al-Fawzan, basically, you know, whoever he was alluding to, whether it's myself, or, I doubt it, it was myself, but just, you know, for argument's sake, it was me. It was that, that question was asked, uh, you know, on behalf of those who have got access to the majlis and the sa'il, meaning the questioner asked the question on behalf of someone in the UK or even the US or whoever. But whether it was direct or me, it's irrelevant. So Sheikh Al-Fawzan obviously answers by saying, all right, then, you know, what does he know? You know, he's, a, he's got compounded ignorance and Sheikh Al-Islam, you know, transmitted from it and etc, etc. And then Sheikh Al-Fawzan gives his opinion. So what we want to do first, we're going to get to the transmission of the book, the Riwayat Al-Kitab. We're going to go through that later on. And we're also going to go through the life of Al-Barbahari. And we're going to basically put everything together and leave no doubt at the end of this video that as the three positions I mentioned earlier, because it could only fit into either one of them. And these are the type of people that are promoting Barbahari's book and saying, look at this book, you know, the true Aqidah. And it, it, it coincides with other books of creed. It's the same as Muzani or, you know, Khalq al Ibad or, you know, Sabuni or, you know, La uh, Laka'i or Juri or Kitab al Tawheed of Ibn Mandah, Kitab al Tawheed of Ibn Khuzayma, you know, it's just. Same Aqidah. Okay. Uh, sorry, you were saying it. You, you're right that we should introduce people to the fact that, and it's not just about Bahari. I think, well, I think the reason why I said it is because we keep quoting him. Well, there's others. Uh, in fact, all the Salafs. No, quoting right? him is enough. Uh, right. uh, yeah, you're right. He's asked. Right. Let's no, take no, Aqidah. Of Muzani, Sabuni. No, no, it's same Aqidah as Sabuni, Raziyani, Muzani, Lalaka. All of them. All of them. Let me ask. We're going to go into the book. Okay. We're going to go into the book. I will show you such problematic statements in this book and some problematic beliefs that if it's ascribed to Barbahari then that shows that Barbahari has some serious issues in creed if we you know if you want to t ascribe it to Barbahari or you could say there's some interpolation from Ghulam Khalid because the Riwayat al-Kitab is what we're going to get to next okay and then we're going to go into Barbahari's life as well from his biographies and all the issues etc how he was and why he wrote in his book you know does it match and if he was if it does match then he contradicted himself if it doesn't then it's possibly that Ghulam Khalid had some interpolation in it so let's get into the book so we're going to dwell into the book first we're going to dwell into statements in the book okay and then we're going to get to uh, other issues as well so in my hand we've got Shar sunnah by Imam al-Barbahari uh, as I like to call it, the Talmud of the Madkhalis. Okay, so let's dwell into the book. Okay, so let's get into this issue, which is a major issue, in fact. Okay, a very major issue. As you can see on screen, you've got a statement from Al Barbahari. Okay, and this is number 26. And it mentions that you should have belief and iman in the Nuzul of Isa bin Maryam, alayhi salam, and he will descend. And he will kill the Dajjal. Okay, so you're supposed to have belief in this, which is not a problem. Then he mentions that he will marry, okay, and he will pray. And he will pray behind, okay, he will pray behind the Qa'im from the family of Muhammad. He would die and he will be buried, okay, in the graveyard of the Muslims. You might be asking me, Haji, what's the problem here? Like what you what you allude to the phrase or the title al qaim meaning the riser the one that will emerge from the family of the Prophet mean Ali Muhammad. This title has no basis amongst Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. No basis at all. This is a Shi'i term. We don't address Imam Mahdi as al qaim Okay, and it's not found in our sources. Okay, that, that, that how we address Al Mahdi. Now, we would say if it is found in Sunni sources, okay, it will be only in Mawdu'at. It will only be in fabricated reports. Okay, this title has no asal amongst Ali Sunnah wal Jama'ah at all. Thai, and this title was also not famous amongst the Ahl al Hadith. Not at all. Okay, they did not utilize this phrase to address. Imam Mahdi. So I'm going to prove now, okay, using Shi'i sources, that the title Al Qa'im is very much a Shi'i term. Okay, so let me present that first. As you can see on screen, this book is Kamal al Deen wa Tamam al Ni'mah by Sheikh Saduq. And as you can see the chapter here, it says 
that this is the chapter of the Milad al Qa'im, Sahib al Zaman, Hujjatillah, Ibn Hassan, Ibn Ali, Bin Muhammad bin Ali, Bin Musa bin Ja'far, Bin Muhammad bin Ali, Bin Hussein bin Ali, Ibn Abi Talib, Salawatullah alayhim. Okay, so as you can see, it says the birth of the Qa'im Sahib al Zaman. Okay, so you see here quite clearly that they've used the word Al-Qa'im. Now this Qa'im refers to the hidden Imam. So when they say Al-Qa'im, they mean the one that's going to emerge and rise, okay, from the Prophet's family at the end of time. They believe he's gone into disappearance. So let's present a hadith now. As you can see on screen, okay, you got a hadith here. And it's narrated by Zurara. Qala, Qala Abu Abdullah alayhi salam, Ya Zurara, la buddha lil Qa'im min ghaybah. That is imp imperative that the Qa'im, meaning the one that's going to rise, the one that's going to merge. It's called apocalyptic, you know, significance. He, would, he needs to obviously uh, go into disappearance. And then Zurara said, but why is that? And he says, يُخَافُ ala nafsihi," And he fears for himself, meaning from death. And he pointed his hand or directed his hand towards his stomach. Okay, meaning that he would uh, disappear and he fears for death. Okay. Now, we now ask the following questions. We're going to go into other aspects of the book as well to show you that there's some dubious statements in here. And also, there's some stances that Barbahari held, okay, in his lifetime, which was very important, okay? And we'll get to that and, you know, ask some counter questions. So now, one or two things we would have to ask the Madakhila and the Super Salafis and those who are, uh, you know, emotionally attached to them. One is that you would have to accept either Barbahari actually added this in his work, if you ask, attribute the book to him. So he placed the word or the term Al-Qa'im min Ali Muhammad, that the Qa'im from the Prophet's family will come. Okay, as it says here, he will come from the Prophet's family and he will die and he will be buried with the Muslims. So this title has no basis amongst Ali Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So now, either the second option is that Barbahari had Shi'i leanings. He had, you know, Tashayya. He had Shi'i tendencies. Okay. Because this title has no basis amongst Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And if you do find this amongst our traditions, it will be in fabricated reports. You won't find this amongst the authentic reports. Okay. So, either Barbahari had Shi'i tendencies. Okay. So he had Tashayya. Or Ghulam Khalid added this in the work. Okay, there's some interpolation. So he added it in himself. So you only got one or two, two options here. Barbahari put it in it. So you accept Barbahari added this term and this title, uh, Al Qa'im min Ali Muhammad, which is very much a Shi'i, uh, you know, propaganda. Okay. Next part of this video is that we're going to look into the book we're going to dwell into the book like i've already done with this particular uh point regarding uh al -Qaim, okay because it, it is irregular okay this is not uh you know popular amongst uh the hanabila first and foremost L let's just restrict it to the hanabila they didn't use this term al -Qaim. secondly this wasn't popular amongst al hadith they didn't use that term okay and thirdly the only ones that did are those who had shi'i tendencies so one, Ghulam Khalil wrote the book, okay, which you won't accept. You believe it's Barbahari, so Barbahari had the Shia, he had uh, Shi'i leanings, or uh, Ghulam Khalil added this in. So this is some interpolation. So how can you trust a book that's had interpolation from the Dajjal of Baghdad? This point I'm going to bring now is very, very powerful and very, very interesting. And there's a lot of questions that need to be asked because once I present it, you, it will make more sense. As you can see on screen, we've got the book, Tabaqat al-Hanabila by Ibn Abi Ya'la, okay? And as you can see on screen, he mentions a narration, okay, an athar. Al-Barbahari never convened a majlis, meaning a sitting, without mentioning that Allah will sit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam next to himself on the throne. So basically, Barbahari never started his majlis, meaning whenever, whenever he used to have a session to teach, he, it was imperative that he always used to mention, okay, always, 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will sit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam next to him on the arsh. So there was an opinion amongst the extreme uh, Hanabila who were, you know, borderline anthropomorphists that they believed that this verse means from the uh, explanation of Mujahid that this means that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will sit with, next to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his arsh. And he mentions, obviously in the Arabic, he says, Lam barbahari yadlisu majlisan. That Barbahari never ever started a majlis, except he used to mention in that majlis, uh, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that Barbahari basically used to mention in every majlis, without fail, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would sit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam next to him on his arsh. Okay. So, one would argue then, Haji, so one could ask now, Haji, what's your point? Okay, what's your point? To show you how important this was to the Hanabila, because I'm going to get to why I'm mentioning this in a second. Don't worry about it. But I'm just going to give you a context first, and then I will explain why this is important. Okay, so, so just to recap, Barbahari never used to start a majlis or a session, except that he used to mention always that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will sit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam next to him on the Day of Judgment, meaning on his arsh on the Day of Judgment. So, let me present you something now that will show you how important that the Hanabila, meaning saw this, um, you know, belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will sit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam next to him on his arsh. As you can see on screen, you got the book of Sunnah by Abi Bakr al-Khallal, okay, Abi Bakr al-Khallal. And he mentions a st uh, basically a, a statement from Abu Bakr al marudi okay, he was a direct student of Imam Ahmed. He said, وَإِنَّ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ لَا يُنْكِرُهُ إِلَّا مُبْتَدِعَ الْجَحْمِ He said that this hadith or this particular statement that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would sit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam next to him on his arsh. No one denies this except a innovator or a jahmi innovator. Okay? A jahmi innovator. So, Abu Bakr al marudi okay, was a direct student of Imam Ahmed, held this position to such an extent and this belief that if anyone denies this, is a jahmi mu'tadi'a. And as I mentioned previously from Ibn Abi Ya'la uh, Tabaqat al Hanabila, he said that Al Barbahari never convened a session or never started a majlis. Except he used to always mention that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will sit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa next to him on his arsh. To further substantiate how important and how the Hanabila, meaning in Barbahari and the, the Hanabila at that time, was so extreme in this, that they held this belief, that they even fought and there was a major riot to the point that people lost their lives because the Hanabila forced people to believe this and they accuse people of being Mubtadi' al-Jahmi. As you can see on screen, we've got the book Al-Kami fi tariq by Ibn al-Athir. Okay? And in the year 317, and Barbahari was alive at that time, he mentions, وَفِيهَا وَقَعَتْ فِتْنَ الْعَظِيمِ بِبَغْدَادِ بَيْنَ أَصْحَابِ أَبِي بَكْرَ الْمَارُوذِ الْحَنْبَلِ وَبَيْنَ غَيْرِهِمْ Min al -amma. That he mentions that there was a major fitna that took place in Baghdad between the companions of Abi Bakr al Marudi al Hanbali and between the general masses of the people. Because the, the companions of al Marudi, who was a student of Imam Ahmed, and obviously al Barbahari was part of it, used to say, in the, or according to the tafsir, that the ayat, perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or perhaps your Lord will send you on a, a, a praise platform. That they explain that ayat, okay, perhaps your Lord will send you on a praise platform, that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will sit the Prophet with him on his arsh. There was another group of people that said إِنَّمَا هُوَ الشَّفَاعَةِ That the, the other group said this is the intercession. Okay? فَوَقْعَتِ الْفِتْنَةِ وَقْتَطَلُوا And then, that, then occurred or what happened was a fitna and they fought فَقُتِلَ بَيْنَهُمْ قَتْلَ الْكَثِيرِ And between them there was major bloodshed, meaning major killing. You must be asking me now, Haji, what, what, why are you getting out? Alright, you made your point. Barbahari never used to start a session or a majlis 
until he mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would sit the Prophet ﷺ next to him on his arsh. Abu Bakr al-Marudhi used to accuse his opponents of being Mubtadi' al-Jahmi if they denied it. Okay, And in 317, such a major catastrophe happened that the companions of uh, Abu Bakr al-Marudhi, which included al-Barbahari, rioted and fought those who denied it and said no you're wrong it's a shafa'a and they fought each other actually they, it was a major battle or a fight and people lost their lives so you must be asking me Haji what's your point mate get to it son so you would think Barbahari would have placed this in his book of creed he doesn't if he did wrote it he didn't place it in his book but he places other things in his book which has got no relevance to creed at all so we were asked the following question if he, could, if he was willing to, if Barbahari actually wrote the book and he places all of these things in his book, okay, which are non-creed, it's non-creedal. Why did he need place the belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will sit the Prophet sallallahu next to him on his arsh? Let's now bring the irregularities of what Barbahari placed in his book, if it's indeed written by him. You will ask, well, why hasn't Barbahari bought this in his book, if he indeed wrote it? As you can see on screen, okay, we've got a shara sunnah. Under 55, Barbahari mentions in his book, if he, if he indeed wrote it, وَلَا نِكَا إِلَّا بِوَلِي That there's no nika except with a wali and, wit and just witnesses who are truthful. Okay? A small number or a lot. Okay? And if they don't have any of this, then the wali will be the sultan. Okay? And that, and, and that person will be the wali for that person. Okay? So this has got nothing to do with creed. Okay? So if indeed Barbahari wrote this, Okay, because you're claiming Barbahari wrote this. He hasn't placed this maqam of Mahmud, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to the Hanabila at the time, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would sit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam next to him on his arsh. But he places in his creed book that there is no nikah except with a wali and witnesses who are just and truthful, literal, small number. And if they don't have a wali, then the Sultan will be the wali, etc. So why hasn't Barbahari placed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will sit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam next to him on his arsh? Where in fact he used to mention this in every session. How come Barbahari hasn't presented this in his book? But he presents about nikah and walis and, and witnesses and etc. Let's bring some other irregularities. As you can see on screen. Number 56. It mentions that if a man divorces his wife three times, his woman three times, she has become haram upon him. وَلَا تَحِلُّ لَهُ and it is impermissible, or she is impermissible for him until she marries another man. Okay? Until she marries another man. So, the question to ask now is, two matters of fiqh in a book of creed. If this was written by Barbahari, how can you explain that Barbahari hasn't placed in his creed book, if he indeed wrote it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place the Prophet sallallahu or sit the Prophet sallallahu next to him on his arsh. But he brings two statements about there is no nikah except with a wali who just etc. And the next one is that if a man divorces his wife three times, she become haram upon him and it's not permissible or he's, she's not permissible for him except until she remarries another man. What's going on here? So do you ascribe the book to Barbahari? If you do, then there's a contradiction right here. Barbahari hasn't placed such an important matter that he used to mention every majlis in every sitting but places these two facets in there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that Barbahari, if he indeed wrote the book, has placed weak and fabricated hadith inside this book. So as I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to get to now the weak and fabricated hadith. If obviously you believe that Barbahari wrote it, then obviously there's only two or three options. Either it's been wrongly ascribed to Ghulam Khalid, so Barbahari actually wrote the book, so then you'll have to explain how Barbahari, if he indeed wrote the book, places matters of fiqh, obviously, in his book, but doesn't place matters which he used to mention every single majlis which is connected to creed. How do you explain that? If it's indeed written by Barbahari. But, again, you could argue that Ghulam Khalil, who's the Dajjal of Baghdad, actually ascribed it to himself. That's one. Number two is that Ghulam Khalil basically changed the work, meaning there's some interpolation to appease the Abbasids and, and, and other things as well. We're going to get to the Abbasids later. Or the third option is that Ghulam Khalil actually wrote the book. So we've already explained that, you know, about the Mahdi, etc. So Barbahari had Shi'i tendencies. If you believe that, okay, that Barbahari wrote the book and you're stern upon it, then Barbahari definitely had uh, Shi'i leanings. He had Shi'i tendencies. No doubt about it. Because no one would use the phrase Al-Qa'im, min Ali Muhammad. Okay? And secondly now, Obviously, I've just explained two matters of fiqh are placed in the book, but the main thing about Prophet sitting next to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the arsh, which they believe that if anyone doesn't 
believe it, you're a mubtada or a, and a, a jahmi, a mubtada jahmi, and the third is they, they killed people for it. They actually fought and they slaughtered people. They killed each other for this. But Bahari didn't place this in his book that he used to mention in every mission. And number 82, he mentions that know that the first to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in paradise or in Jannah are the blind. Uh, الرجال, النساء, then the men, then the women with their own eyes. As the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said that you would see or indeed you would see your Lord as you can see the moon when the night or the moon when the night is full and you have no issues in seeing him or no difficulties in seeing him. And he mentions وَالْإِيمَانُ بِهَا وَاجِبُ وَإِنْكَارُهُ كُفْرُ And it's imperative that you believe in this, it's wajib. And whoever denies it has committed disbelief. Okay, so this belief here Okay, this belief here that the first people to see uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in heaven is the blind and then the men and then the women with their own physical eyes. I will be completely honest with you. I've never heard of this before. I've never heard that they, the first people to look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in heaven are the blind then the men then the women with their own eyes. I've never heard of this before. So, where's Barbahari got this from? If indeed Barbahari wrote it. So, as I mentioned, the, the, the three points either it was ascribed uh, by Ghulam Khalil incorrectly, number two, that there's some interpolation. Uh, and number three, that Ghulam Khalil actually wrote it. Okay, there's a possibility that Ghulam Khalil wrote it. Or if you want to accept the fourth one, that Barbahari wrote it. So now, where has he got this belief from? Because he can't place it in the books of creed if there's got no relevance to creed. And if he's not even authentic, because our creed is qat'i, is definitive. Can't use, you know, inauthentic reports to, to base creed upon. Do you understand? So let's look at the opinion of Sheikh Al Fawzan in his Sharh book, okay? And let's see what he says about it, okay? As you can see on my, in, in my hand, I've got Sharh Sunnah by uh, Al Barbahari or Ghulam Khalil, or even interpolation, meaning that Barbahari did write it, but Ghulam Khalil dabbled with it. So as you can see, uh, under page 207, uh, this is the explanation of Sheikh Al Fawzan under that. Uh, comment from Barbahari, if it's indeed written by Barbahari, that know that the first people to see Allah is the blind, then the men, then the women with their own eyes, etc. And Sheikh al Fawzan, basically, is just not even two sentences. So Sheikh al Fawzan is basically saying that he's tried to find this particular, uh, you know, statement or narration or whatever. And he says, He says that. I've tried to find this particular narration from this from this from the author who is either Barbahari or the Dajjal of Baghdad or it was written by Barbahari but this has been added by Ghulam Khalid and he said this needs evidence okay Sheikh Al-Fawzan is basically saying okay and this is page 200 here here it is uh, Sheikh Al-Fawzan from uh, the explanation of Shara Sunnah by Imam Barbahari he's saying that this needs evidence Okay, there is no such evidence for this. So what Sheikh al Fawzan is in essence saying, there is no evidence for this particular statement. Okay, there is no evidence for it. Barbahari mentioned this, if it's indeed written by Barbahari. There's no evidence for it. So how can he place, if he indeed wrote it, either Ghulam Khalid wrote the whole book, either Barbahari you believe wrote it, if he indeed wrote it, why is he presenting uh, matters of creed, okay, which there's no evidence for, okay? Or you could say the Dajjal of Baghdad, added it in there, okay? So how can you trust a book that's got, and we'll get to the Rawayat al Kitab, and we keep mentioning that because that's important as well. It's gonna be very lengthy. I also said before that, you know, you try to substantiate this, to say it's Bar Bahari's book, so explain what the hell's going on. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna dwell into the book first. I'm gonna, there's many, many statements I'm gonna present to you, and then I'm gonna show you uh, Bar Bahari's life, his actions, and certain statements, etc. You're just gonna think, what the hell's going on here? That this is not adding up at all. So. Let's present you another statement from, if again, if it's indeed Barbahari, then you've got problems. If it isn't, if you say no, Barbahari didn't write it, then there's an issue, isn't there? How can you take a book that wasn't even, you know, 100% that you could affirm that it's written by Barbahari, or it was written by the Dajjal of Baghdad? Your options are very limited. Let's carry on. As you can see, okay, this is number 19. Okay, so I'm going back. As you can see, this is number 19. And he states, if Barbahari is indeed wrote it, he says, والإيمان بحوض الرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ولكل النبي حوض. That he said is imperative to believe that there's the hold of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and that every prophet has a hold, meaning a pool. إلا صالح النبي عليه السلام فإن حوضه 
Dar'u naqati. Except the Prophet Salih. For indeed his hold was the order of his she camel. Okay? So the order of his she camel. So this is a uh, matter of creed. So according to Al Barbahari, if it's again indeed ascribed to Barbahari, that obviously uh, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have to believe that he has a hold, meaning the, the, the pool, and that every Prophet has a pool except for Salih and Nabi, because his uh, hold was the uh, orders of uh, the Shi Kamal. Okay. So, where did Barbahari get this from? Okay. This particular matter of creed must have some sort of proof. And if he has proof, then he has to be authentic. Don't you agree? I'm going to surprise you today. As you can see on screen, we've got the book, Kitabul Mawdu'at. Doesn't sound good, does it? Doesn't sound good at all. Kitabul Mawdu'at by Ibn Jawzi al hanbali and as you, so under uh, as you can see al hadith al thani this is the hadith okay this is the hadith and this hadith is totally unauthentic okay it is indeed fabricated as you can see he states hada hadith mawdu' la asl lahu qala al uqayli abdul karim majhul bi naql al wahadith ghair mahfuz he says that this hadith is fabricated and there's no support for it. Uqayli, Al Uqayli said, Abdul Karim, this person in the narration, is unknown and he transmits hadith ghair mahfud without you know, uh, clarity, without intent. He doesn't preserve it basically. So, back to my point about the irregularities. If Barbahari indeed wrote the book, okay, we haven't got to the Riwayat al Kitab yet and we haven't got to his contradictions. From what the book, what he's wrote in his book, if he's allegedly wrote it, and his life. We're going to show you his actions and his life as well. That this individual was kind of aggressive, you know, he, and I'm, I'm going to get to that later. So don't worry about it. We're not, going to, we're not going to leave anything out. Believe me. So, those who, and the madakhila rather, and those super Salafis always argue. Same, same aqeedah. Same aqeedah as Muzani, as La Lakaiz, uh, like Ajuri, uh, like Kitabul. Tawheed of Ibn Khuzaym, like Kitab al Tawheed of Ibn Mandah, like Khagal of Ali Libad, same Aqidah, Aqidah to Tahawiyya, same Aqidah, Akhi. Okay, same Aqidah. <laughs> so, fabricated hadith. Fabricated. He's basing creed upon fabricated hadith. So, do you accept that Barbahari wrote this? Again, like I said, if Ghulam Khalil wrote it, then I can understand, because he's a liar anyway, he's a Dajjal of Baghdad. I can accept this from Ghulam Khalil. But, I don't believe that Barbahari wrote it. And if you say, I'm going to get to the kalams of the ulama as well, Ibn Taymiyyah, al Dahabi, etc. Don't worry about it. We're not going to leave that out as well. It's like I said before, uh, you're punching above your weight. So if you're still adamant that Barbahari wrote it, he presented a statement to back his claim using fabricated ahadith. Fabricated. Not even da'if. Mawdu'a. Okay, so you still accept that Barbahari wrote this book? If you do, then get off your high horse, mate. Get off your high horse, because this is beyond ridiculous. Titles of Shi'i titles and, you know, things of matters that got no relevance, okay, uh, totally fiqh related are in his books of creed, or in his book of creed. And the thing that he used to mention in every majlis isn't uh, in this book. And the what he fought for and killed for isn't mentioned in this book. And those... Leaders of the Hanabila accuse those of being Jahmi or Mubtadi'a Jahmi and he's not based in uh, or he's not placed in Shara Sunnah but he places fabricated hadith inside. We haven't stopped just yet. We're going to continue the irregularities. My batteries are 9% so I'll put it on low power mode and keeps turning off. So there's another statement here in here. He mentions that wa arwah al kuffar wal fujjar fi barahut. He mentions that the souls of the disbelievers, the kuffar, are within a wall of Barahut, wa hiya fi sijjin. Okay? And are in sijjin. Okay. But Barbahari brings a statement and says that the souls of the kuffar and the fujjar are in a wall of Barahut. Okay? So, is this authentic? Okay? Is this authentic? Let's find out. As you can see on screen, okay, you've got an article written by Dr. Sultan al Amiri, okay, and he basically critiques the book Shara Sunnah, okay, 
And a lot of this is what I'm getting is from him. Okay, so you can't say Brother Hajj is critiquing it. It is obviously research as well as bringing statements of the ulama. And he mentions, and there's his fault. Okay, and there's his photo as well, just in case you might be thinking I'm making it up. There he is, Dr. Sultan Abdul Rahman Al Amiri. Okay, and he mentions that the souls of the kuffar being in a in a sort of while in Barahut, okay, is not authentic. Okay, and many of the ulama have weakened it, even even uh, Rajab Al Hanbali and other than him. And you won't find Imam Ahmed obviously authenticate this as well. Dr. Sultan Al Amiri is saying that this is inauthentic. Even Rajab. And various other scholars have said it's inauthentic. So the question to ask is, a fabricated hadith is mentioned in Shara Sunnah, and now a weak hadith is also mentioned in Shara Sunnah, regarding a wow uh, about the souls of the kuffar. I've never heard of it. So when you argue that this is the same as Muzani, and that this is the first time we're dwelling into it, dwelling into this. And if you were taught this, then I think you should have questioned it. But you guys, don't, I don't think you actually you go, go over this. And if you do, you just basically just, you know, pass over it quickly. This is inauthentic. As Dr. Sultan al amiri confirms that Ibn Rajab and others have deemed this as inauthentic. So we've got now a weak uh, report in Shara Sunnah by Barbahari, if in the need written by Barbahari, if you want to accept that. And now a weak hadith. Obviously, as confirmed by other scholars. So now I ask you, okay, that the irregularities are clear from the text. I'm going to get to other facets later. So now I'm going to pace through this a bit, okay, because I'm going to get to the main part of the video. So obviously, this is just to highlight the irregularities of statements which are attributed to Barbahari in Shara Sunnah. You can see there's some issues, definitely some issues. As you can see on screen, number 95. He mentions that no, that muta'a, muta'a with women and making it halal for yourself is haram into the day of judgment. So what the hell has this got to do with creed? But the thing that he used to mention daily, constantly in, in his majlis, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying the Prophet ﷺ next to him on his arsh, is not mentioned in the book. But muta'a with women is. Figure that one out. If Barbahari wrote it, he seriously got some priorities mixed up. Next. Uh, number 43, wala uh, ba'as. Number 43, wala ba'as bi That number 43 he mentions that there's no problem praying in trousers. So praying in trousers is a matter of creed or place in his creed book, but something that he mentions constantly every day in his majlis, and something that's a matter of creed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will sit the Prophet next to him on his arsh is not mentioned at all. And the, the same thing that they accuse people of being Muqtadi' Jahmi for, which is definitely a matter of creed, it's not mentioned in Shara Sunnah of Barbahari. And also the thing that he fought for and killed for is not mentioned in Shara Sunnah, but praying in trousers is. Go figure that one out. And 165, uh, point 100, uh, 165, he says, whoever affirms anything in this book, believes in it and takes it as a guide, and does not doubt one letter, in fact, and does not doubt one letter, for he is the person of the Sunnah and the Jama'ah and is completed or is complete in his Sunnah. And whoever denies one word of this book, the one word of this book, um, or doubts anything, or, or doubts one word, sorry, in fact, okay, or stops in it, meaning that he doesn't believe it, then he is Sahib al Hawa, okay, he is Sahib al Hawa. So, as you can see, okay, as you can see clearly, that there's so much irregularities of this book to the point that, you know, you've got to question yourself. You have to question yourself, think, hold on, yeah. if Barbahari did wrote this book, then one, he's got Shi'i leanings, he's basically got Shi'i tendencies. Number two, that for something that he wants to fight for, okay, something that he wants to fight for and die for and kill for, what is in place in his book, but fabricating the weak narrations are. Also, the pray, uh, what's it called, uh, the praise platform, okay, which I mentioned, that isn't placed in his book. And then he brings stuff about the wilds which are inauthentic about uh, the, the, the hawda of Salih alayhi salam, the naqa, uh, which is fabricated. And then he brings about muta'a, he brings about, you know, whoever denies a letter in this book has denied and rejected, uh, or is not a person of sunnah, and whoever doubts in my book has rejected Allah's religion. You still believe Barbahari wrote this book? Still, but you still believe this is basically the book that you brag, that you guys, you know, Broadcast and say it's the same aqidah as the aqidah to salaf. No, it's not. No, it's not. So, this book here, I'm telling you now, there's some issues. Okay, if you want to ascribe this to Barbahari, then you're in a deeper mess. In this book, there's been some interpolation. Ghulam Khalid had some naughty, naughty uh, involvement in this book. So, if you want me to be completely honest, thus far, I honestly believe Barbahari 
this book has had interpolation. Meaning, Ghulam Khalil, okay, the chain, obviously, that we're going to get to, the Riwayat al-Kitab, we're going to get to that. I honestly believe there's been some interpolation in this book. If you want to argue, I believe Ghulam Khalil wrote it. But if you want to argue that Shur sunnah and we're going to get to the statements of the ulama, that Shur sunnah was indeed written by uh, Al-Barbahari, even though the Riwayat al-Kitab would disprove that. But just say, for the sake of argument, we'll concede that Barbahari actually did write the book. Then, there's been some interpolation. There's definitely been some interpretation. There's either one of the two. As I said, I'm leaning towards the position that he didn't even write it. What I'm going to do is present an evidence now to show you that many books of creed were mentioned by this scholar, okay? And he died uh, 535. And this scholar here, Shafi'i scholar, basically doesn't bring Barbahari. And he mentions all the scholars who wrote creed books or mentioned creed, okay? Barbahari is in place in his book. But guess what? Ghulam Khalil is. As you can see on screen, we've got the book. Al-Hujjatu fi Bayan al-Muhajja fi Shar al-Aqeedah ahli Sunnah. And this is by Ismail bin Muhammad bin uh, Fadl al-Tamimi al-Asbahani. Okay, and he's also known as Abu Qasim. And he basically mentions, obviously, the, the sheikhs from the Salaf and the Khalaf. Okay, and obviously mentions the chapter of, of Aqeedah and those who obviously practice the Sunnah and publicize their Aqeedah. And he mentions a few, you know, various Imams. So as you can see, okay, he mentions, obviously, um, Muhammad, uh, uh, Abu Muhammad Sufyan ibn Uyayna, uh, and he mentions obviously uh, various others. I'm just going to leave it on there. Ibn Mubarak is mentioned for Dil ibn Ayyad, Waqi ibn Jarrah, wa Yusuf ibn Asbat. Uh, they've made their aqidah apparent, and also he mentions uh, Sharif ibn Abdullah al Nakhai. Uh, bin Said al -Qattan. Okay, and then as, as I uh, presented in my last video, he mentions uh, Ahmed bin Muhammad bin Ghalib al Ma'roof bi Ghulam Khalil, Sahib Ahmed bin Hanbal. And he mentions, uh, you know, the Dajjal of Baghdad. Okay, he mentions the Dajjal of Baghdad. So you see, the point here is that if Barbahari indeed wrote the book, okay, why hasn't this scholar brought him in with the other scholars? If this was ma'roof, okay, this was known, this was something that was already, you know, confirmed. And this is, a, he died in 565. So that's why I lean towards the position that Barbahari didn't write this book. So this book here, uh, in terms of what we have today, uh, the uh, manuscript, the maqtutat, which is used to obviously prove, uh, or rather, you know, publish uh, the book to say, yeah, this is written by, you know, who? Okay, Al-Barbahari, allegedly. What well, we'll do is go through the Riwayat al-Kitab now, okay? So let's go through the chain of the Riwayat, okay? And where does this uh, manuscript come from, as you can see on screen? Okay, this is the title. This is the Damascus manuscript, okay? This is the Damascus manuscript. And this is basically the authentication of the names of the scholars who basically transmitted the work, Shur sunnah and where it was taught, okay? And who obviously then taught it thereafter and transmitted the text. Okay, uh, so the Rawayat al-Kitab basically is replicated. So the first page, okay, the title page, as you can see, underline, uh, or the title is uh, Kitab Shara Sunnah, as you can see at the top. And then it's got the name Abdullah Ahmed uh, Muhammad bin Ghalib al-Bahili, and then it says Ghulam Khalil, as you can see at the title. Okay, and at the bottom, he basically gives you the uh, transmitters. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to the uh, second page, as you can see here. So I'm just going to put it on screen for a bit. Okay, so this is the full page now, up until uh, Alhamdulillah, Hadana did Islam. As you can see, it's got all the names of their birth dates. Okay, uh, Hijrian and Gregorian. Okay, so let's go through it. So the first, so we we'll go from obviously the the oldest into obviously where it was transmitted to. So you got Abu Hussein Abdul Haq bin Abdul Khalik, who was born 494 and died 575. Okay, then you got Abu Talib Abdul Qadir bin Muhammad bin Yusuf, who was born 430 and died 516. So as you can see, okay, that these uh, individuals were transmitted. Abu Ishaq Ibrahim bin Umar. Bin Ahmed al Barmaqi, uh, 361 to 445. Okay. You got Abu al Hassan Muhammad bin al Abbas bin al Furat, 319 to 384. Then you got, this is an important name that you have to bear in mind, Abu Bakr Ahmed bin Kamil bin Khalaf bin Shajar. Okay. And then you've got the infamous name. Abu Abdullah Ahmed bin Muhammad bin Ghalib al Bahili Ghulam Khalid. So as you can see on screen, I'm just going to put the manuscript. I'm going to bring you something, uh, bring you, bring you to an important point. It mentions that 
Ahmed bin Kamil bin Khalf bin Shaja' al-Qadi narrated to us being read to him. He said, Abu Abdullah Ahmed bin Muhammad bin Ghalib al-Bahli al-Ghulam Khalil gave this book to me and said, narrate this book from me from start to finish. And then he mentioned the book. Okay. So the first point I want to bring your attention to is this, that the first earliest transmitter was Ahmed bin Kamil. Okay. He was given a copy by the book by the author, okay, which is Ghulam Khalil. And he said, transmit this book on my authority from beginning to end. Okay, so as you can see, Ghulam Khalil was the one, okay, Ghulam Khalil was the one that said, transmit this book on my authority from beginning to end. You must be wondering, why am I mentioning Ibn Kamal? The reason why I mention Ibn Kamal is because Ibn Kamal was the student of Imam Al-Tabari, okay, and to the point that he was, on, he was with him, or Imam Al-Tabari, at his deathbed, okay. So, what relevance has this got to do with Barbahari? I'll explain now. So as you can see on screen, you got the Busir al-Alam al Imam al-Dahbi. And we got the biography of Muhammad ibn Jarir, meaning Imam al-Tabari. So an individual was asked by uh, Ibn Khuzaim al-Muhaddith uh, that basically you wrote to Imam Jarir al-Tabari, etc, etc. But I'm just going to a long story short. And basically they mentioned that Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, okay, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari was oppressed by the Hanabila. Okay, so what does that mean? What does that mean that Ibn Jarir al-Tabari was oppressed by the Hanabila? He was oppressed by Imam al-Barbahari, okay? To the point that he had to leave Baghdad. The Hanabila headed by Imam al-Barbahari oppressed Imam al-Tabari. So what relevance has this got to do with Ibn Kamal? Okay, so the reason why I've mentioned this is because why would Ibn Kamal, okay, narrate Shara Sunnah if it was indeed from Barbahari, when Barbahari himself oppressed Imam al-Tabari? Ibn Kamal was a student of Imam al-Tabari. Okay, and was at his deathbed. Okay, where's your proof for this? As you can see on screen, we've got the book. Okay, Tarikh Medina to Dimishq by Ibn Asakir. And he mentions, okay, that when Imam al Tabari was about to die, okay, Wahadar al Waqt al Mawtihi, Jama'at min Ashab in Minhum by Imam al Tabari, he says, Abu Bakr ibn Kamal. Ibn Kamal was at his deathbed. And he said to him, okay, before his rule departed, Oh, Abu Ja'far, uh, you are a, a, a evidence between uh, Allah. The point here is, the point here is that Ibn Kamal was the one that transmitted this when Ghulam Khalil said, transmit this book from me. So if this book was from Al-Barbahari, okay, indeed it was written by Barbahari, Ibn Kamal wouldn't be the person that would be narrated from Al-Barbahari because Ibn Al-Barbahari was oppressed by Imam Al-Tabari who was his teacher. So it doesn't make any sense for Ibn Kamal, okay, to transmit from Al-Barbahari. Does that make any sense? Now what we're going to prove now is Ibn Kamal had issues himself, had issues in terms of being a narrator. So Ibn Kamal, in terms of the historical fact, he wouldn't be, well shouldn't be anyway, a student of Ibn Imam Al-Barbahari, whilst Imam Al-Barbahari was an enemy of Imam Al-Tabari and oppressed him whilst he was in Baghdad. So Imam Ibn Kamal was at the deathbed of Imam al-Tabari. So it shows he was his loyal student to the end. So it doesn't make any sense, because obviously in narrating from Ghulam Khalil, this is why I'm arguing that Ghulam Khalil was the author of the book, not Imam al-Barbahari. But nevertheless, what we're going to do now is show you the biography of Ibn Kamal. So because he's in the chain, obviously if you're arguing it wasn't Ghulam Khalil, that in fact Ibn Kamal narrated this from al-Barbahari, that's your argument, you're saying that Ghulam Khalil, you know, forced himself into the issue and there's some interpolation, there's distortions, etc. Let's look at the biography of Ibn Kamal to show you that this individual is a bit shady as well. As you can see on screen, Sir al-Alam al And we've got Ibn Kamal, okay? And as you can see, it says, قَالَ الدَّارَ قُطْنِي كَانَ مُتَسَاحِلًا رُبَّمَا حَدِّذْ مِنْ حِفْذِهِ بِمَا لَيْسَ فِي كِتَابِهِ وَأَحْلَقُهُ الْعُجُبْ كَانَ يَخْطَارُ لِنَفْسِي وَلَا يُقَلِّدُ أَحَدًا He says that Dara Qutni mentions that this Ibn Kamal was easy going, was mutasahil. Perhaps he used to narrate from his memory, but which was not in the book. And his self-amazement destroyed him because he used to choose himself. He used to prefer himself and he never used to follow anyone. But mutasahil basically means that he wasn't serious. He was basically easy going. He never used to really be careful. And to the point that he says, Imam Dara Qutni is saying this, and Imam Adah bin narrated, he says, Rubba ma hadith min hifdihi. Okay, bima laysa fi kitabihi. That remember, Ghulam Khalid said to him, transmit this from me. Remember, Ghulam Khalid said, transmit this from me. So, Dara Qutni said he was easy going, and perhaps he used to, you know, narrate from his memory, but not from the book. 
So how many proofs have we provided to show you that Barbahari's book has got some strange things in there. So when Barbahari gave him, oh, sorry, when Ghulam Khalil, <laughs> the Dajjal Baghdad, gave him the book, it goes, transmit this from me. He should transmit from his memory, not from the book, according to Zahar Qutani. So how do you know the stuff in Shara Sunnah is actually from Barbahari or even Ghulam Khalil? You understand? It's so, there's so much issue. You notice the Madakhila more notably. The Super Salafites as well, but more notably the Madakhila who raised his book like the, the Jews treat the Talmud, like the Jews treat the Talmud. Is that they always bring the, uh, you know, quote from Imam al-Bahari, as you can see on screen, that whoever uh, rebels against the ruler and the Imams and the Muslims, from the Imams and the Muslims, he's a Khariji, have separated the, the, you know, the stuff of the Muslims and he has opposed the text and dies the death of Jahiliyyah. And then he says, it's not permissible to fight the Sultan and to rebel against him, even if they are oppressive. And as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, be patient even if the slave was an, uh, even if the ruler was an a Ethiopian slave. Uh, and his statement towards the Ansar, be patient until you meet me at the Hawq. These statements are repeated quite often from the Madakhila, you know, and they always use this statement to, and they, they, they make tabdi on people because of that. What they don't tell you is that Barbahari actually himself weren't patient with the rulers and was a rebel. Now when we say khuruj, he didn't actually do khuruj in terms of trying to topple them, but he wasn't patient with the ruler and he actually challenged the authority and to the point he went into hiding and died in hiding. And he used to riot, you know, and cause havoc. So he weren't what you call a law-abiding citizen, if you want to call him that. He was quite aggressive. And he, he to the point that the Khalif sought for him. He used to destroy shops and he was, you know, they, they, they were robbed. They were rioters and they, were, they had mobs and stuff. So Barbahari himself was quite aggressive, as you can see on screen. We got the book Seer Al-A'la Mulubala, okay, by Imam Al-Dahabi. And he mentions that... Barbahari uh, used to strive hard and he stood for the religion and he used to oppose and get the Sultan angry and they ordered for his arrest so he went into hiding okay he went into hiding and then the story goes on and on then they went to Basra etc and then Barbahari returned etc and it just carries on to the point that Barbahari himself was a bit of a fire starter the Sultan weren't happy with him so he didn't listen and obey his ruler, okay? But Baha'i didn't listen to and obey his ruler. So you can see these statements from Shara Sunnah, okay, about you know, whoever rebels against the ruler. Now technically speaking, Barbahari rebelled against his ruler, meaning he opposed his ruler. He went patient with his oppression because the Khalif, we're going to get to the biography of the Khalif as well. He didn't obey him, even if he was oppressive. But Bahari opposed him and he got the Sultan angry to the point that they used to cause so much problems he ordered his arrest and he went into hiding. They mentioned in the history of Muhammad ibn Mahdi in the year 310 that basically Bar Bahari went into hiding and this is also collaborated uh, as you can see on screen by uh, Tabaqat al Hanabila and he mentions the same thing that he says that Bar Bahari used to strive hard and stand for the religion a lot and he used to oppose and get the Sultan angry. Okay, and the year 310. The Khalif, which is who? Qahir, meaning Qahir Billah. And his wazir, okay, wanted to grab hold of Barbahari, to grasp him, but, you know, to put him under arrest, but he went into hiding, okay? And they grabbed a majority of his companions, and they kept him in Basra, etc., etc. Then he mentions at the bottom, as you can see, he mentions that Barbahari was obviously, you know, the, the, the Haris, the, the, the guards, were, and the police sought after Barbahari and, and his companions. And what happened? Uh, they basically went into hiding and as you can see here right at the bottom and then he mentions that he died in hiding okay he died in hiding and this was in Rajab in 329 so Barbahari himself okay Barbahari himself was a bit of a rebel and he didn't listen to his rulers and his rulers were angry with him and he went into hiding so when you when you read in here whoever obeys and does not listen to the ruler etc etc Barbahari was a bit of a rebel himself Barbahari was a bit of a a, a muscular hanbali, you know, was to go out and cause aggression and riots and, and fighting as you know, look what he did uh, with the uh, people who believed in the Shafa'a. Ah. They fought and they killed and they, he didn't listen to all his rulers, you know, he was uh, uh, causing havoc, etc. Now, as you can see on screen, Ibn Mutawakkil, he was the son of Mutawakkil. And basically, 
going into the biography, he says, وَلَمْ يُكُنِ الْقَاهِرْ مُتَمَكِّنًا مِنْ الْأَمُورِ He says that Qahir didn't really establish and settle the matters, meaning he wasn't really in control of the affairs. That he had a Rafidi with him who used to curse Muawiyah. عَلَى المنابر. He used to curse him on the member. وَقُبِدَ عَلَى الشَّيْخَ الْحَنَابِلَ الْبَرْبَهَارِ He wanted to arrest the Sheikh of the Hanabila al-Barbahari. So even though he had a wazir as a Shi'i Rafidi, okay, remember, you cannot rebel. You have to listen and obey your ruler. Listen and obey your ruler means generally listen and obey in his affairs. You cannot go and riot and you can't go and start you know, attacking people's houses like he did with Imam al-Tabari, etc. So the point I'm raising is that Barbahari, when he writes whoever rebels against a ruler, technically speaking, he didn't listen to his ruler. He didn't listen to him. He did not obey him. So, this statement here, whoever rebels against a ruler, etc, 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 just shows the actions of Barbahari and his life. You see, he, had, he, he oppressed Imam al-Tabari, he had arguments with uh, Abu Hassan al-Ashr, which led him to write al-Ibana uh, al-Asul al-Diyana. He went and fought people, rioting, looting. You know, you can just read his life. Barbahari was very, very uh, aggressive. And, you know, a person that really didn't take no for an answer. Now, um, as you heard uh, Sheikh Al-Fawzan mention, and this is a while back now, uh, let's just play the video to bring you back up to speed. Allah ilaykum sahib al-fadila wa hada sa'in yaqool Hunaka man shakakani fi nisbati hada al-kitab Sharh al-sunnati lil-imam al-barbahari wa yaqool innahu lam yathbut nisbatuhu ilayhi tarikhiyan fahal kalamuhu sahih Hada wa shidriha an al-tarikh wa shidriha an Hada jahil al-murakkab Yani ma yathak bil-ulama an liyathbitaw hada ولا يثق شيخ الاسلام بن تيميه نقل منه نقل منها من هذه الرساله في في فتاواه يعني نكذب الائمه ونصدق هذا وش يدري هذا وش يعرفه بالتاريخ وبحياه العلماء هذا جهل مركب وربما يكون في نفسه شيء على هذه العقيده ما يريد شكك الناس فيها القران ايضا قالوا ما هو بكلام الله تعجبون ما في من قال ان القران ما هو بكلام الله يعني عاجز أحد يقول إن هذه الرسالة ما ما هي بكلام البربهاري ما يعجز نعم. As your Sheikh Fawzan mentioned that obviously again I don't know if this was directed at me I don't think it is I don't think this was directed at me I'm positive but knowing you know the madakhira they must have raised some complaints and got someone to ask Barbahari or ask uh, Fawzan about you know uh, this person bringing doubts about Barbahari's book etc. So he basically goes look Ibn Taymiyyah narrated from it okay Ibn Taymiyyah narrated from it and that he mentions who are you etc so let's now go into that quote and see what actually Ibn Taymiyyah narrated as you can see on screen and the full book's name is Bughiyat al-Murtad fi al-Radda ala mutafalsifa wal-Qaramita wal-Batiniya al-Ilhad min al-Qailina bil-Hulul wal-Ittihad that basically that's the full book's name and as you can see on screen he mentions وَذَكْرَ عَنْ أَبِي مُحَمَّدَ الْبَرْبَهَارِ أَنَّهُ قَالْ it is mentioned from Al-Barbahari Abu Muhammad Al-Barbahari note he hasn't mentioned the book Okay, narrator Abu Muhammad al Barbahari said that the, uh, the aql is not basically acquired, rather, it's a blessing from Allah. And basically, as you can see on screen, Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned, okay, was just in connection to that intellect is not acquired, it's a mercy from Allah. You notice this is not connected to creed. Ibn Taymiyyah, this is the only quote you'll find. Again, quote me if I'm wrong. And Ibn Qayyum, that mentioned al Barbahari. So, even when they mentioned al Barbahari, one Point, they didn't mention the book's name. They just mentioned a quote, which is intellect is not acquired, it's a fadl from Allah. So, just say that when you say Ibn Taymiyyah authenticated the book, that's the only statement you've got. So, if you want to argue that Ibn Taymiyyah authenticated the book, then you have to concede then that all the statements that are presented regarding the irregularities of the book, and how, you know, it just doesn't make any sense that he... You know about the Maqam al Mahmud, about the praise platform, and you know the the issues. Uh, you know with the fabricated hadith and weak hadith, and you know all the things that I mentioned earlier. Ibn Taymiyyah, you know, just mentioned one quote. I'm still of the opinion that Barbahari didn't write the book; it was Ghulam Khalid. Then you have to concede that there's been interpolation in his book. There has to be. You cannot say that Imam Barbahari had Shi'i tendencies because he mentioned Al Qa'im in Ali Muhammad. Do you believe that Barbahari had Shi'i tendencies? Because this is not. A title we use, Ahlul Sunnah, has no basis. This title has no basis. Okay? The Qa'im min Ali Muhammad. And then he believed that the Prophet Sallallahu would sit with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala next to him on his arsh, but yet doesn't mention in his book. He mentions it every majlis. 
they kill people for it. Student of Imam Ahmed, he basically said, you're a Mubtadi Jahmi. At the same place in this book. But yet nikah is, and talaq is, and praying in trousers is, and muta is. But this isn't. Oh, that wasn't placed in there about sitting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sitting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam next to him. This was, that, that wasn't. Let's carry on. As you can see, you got the book, Muqtasar al ulu Okay? Li Ali al Ghaffar. And this is obviously Muqtasar uh, uh, from uh, Sheikh uh, Al Albani. And there you go. As you can see on screen, it says Abu Muhammad al Barbahari, uh, Al Hassan bin Ali bin Khalf, Sheikh Al Hanabil bin Baghdad. And as you can see, he quotes a passage from Shar al Sunnah. And then also you can see Imam al Dahabi in his Sira al Anam al Bala uh, quotes a passage Women uh, Ibarat al Sheikh al Barbahari. He just says Women Ibarat. So he doesn't mention the book's name. You see? And he mentions obviously uh, beware of the small bid'ah, etc. in the matters because very the small bid'ah can then increase to a big bid'ah, etc. etc. And that's in Sharul Sunnah by Imam al-Barbahari. Also Ibn Abi Ya'la in his Tabaqat al-Hanabila also presents the same quote as well. And then he mentions the same quote as well. Ibn Abi Ya'la mentions the exact same thing uh, from the statement from the book Sharul Sunnah of al-Barbahari. So that's the point that I'm trying to raise. So one point is that Dahabi doesn't mention the book's name. Okay? Ibn Taymiyyah doesn't mention the book's name. It's in Sharul Sunnah. Ibn Abi Ya'la mentions the book's name. Now Ibn Abi Ya'la mentioned this 150 years. So prior to that, no one mentioned that this book was written by Imam al-Barbahari. Okay? No one mentioned it apart from Ibn Abi Ya'la. He was the first person to mention 150 years after. Now, the manuscript, as we confirmed, has the Riwat al-Kitab from five leading Hanabila scholars. And the book was transmitted by who? By Ghulam Khalid to Ibn Kamal. Ibn Kamal used to basically never used to care, he was, he was lackadaisy and he used to mention things from his memory that wasn't in the book he was the transmitter of the book Ghulam Khalid the Dajjal of Baghdad that's the end of the video so what I want to add is this that you've got probably three or four options okay so the first one is either it was wrongly ascribed to Ghulam Khalid meaning he ascribed it to himself when he didn't write it so then you have to accept that Barbahari with all those problematic statements and weak hadith and fabricated hadith and Shi'i leanings you have to accept that Barbahari wrote those statements okay so that's point one so it was ascribed by Ghulam Khalid that he wrote the book when he uh, transmitted it to Ibn Qulman well, who was the one that was Mutasahil used to make stuff up not make stuff up but he never used to read it from the book so he used to just put stuff in from his memory. He's mutasahid. He never used to follow ulama. He's, you know, he was self amazed with himself. So two people that transmitted the book that we've got today. We've got today. They're the ones that we're what we're relying the, uh, the manuscript on. The Damascus manuscript. Okay. Number two is that Ghulam Khalid changed the work. So Barbari wrote the book. But Ghulam Khalid changed stuff in this book. Or could have been Ibn Qambal added his own statements in here. Who knows? Do you understand what I mean? Or number three is that Ghulam Khalid wrote the book entirely. So the manuscript that we have, the, the, the Damascus manuscript, the Zahiri from the Zahiri library, that manuscript that which is used to uh, you know, publish this book, it was Ghulam Khalid solely. So that explains like the Shi'i leanings, the weak hadith, the fabricated hadith about not rebelling against the rules because he was quite close to the Abbasids, about not rebelling against rules because Barbahari wasn't a person that listened and obeyed his ruler, let's put it that way. And you know, the apocalyptic uh, sort of, you know, message about the Qa'im, the one that rises, like the proper Shi'i terms. So that means that Barbahari had Shi'i tendencies. So the question is, would you take someone who's got Shi'i tendencies, you know, writes Al-Qa'im? Al-Qa'im is not a Sunni title, mate. It's no basis in Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So this is basically my argument. You see, there's many discrepancies. And as I said before, if they want to take it, that's fine. It's just clear to see that there's so much holes in the narrative that the Madakhila are pushing that this book is not the same as the books of the Salaf. He has so much issues in there, weak hadith, fabricated hadith, Shi'i leanings, uh, stuff that are solely connected to fiqh like nikah, trousers, talaq and all these other things which I can't even remember. I can't even summarize it because I can't even remember. But the point is my argument stands that this book is mashkuk. It's mashkuk. It's questionable. Very questionable that Barbahari Actually, whatever's in here that Barbahari wrote. So, much cool. so this is the point. And that's my argument. So you will rely on the statements of Ibn Taymiyyah that quoted a passage from it. They didn't authenticate the book. He just said, Abu Muhammad al-Barbahari Abu Muhammad al-Barbahari said. That's it. And just one quote. Ad-Dahabi did the same thing. And 
he quote passages from it. He didn't mention the book's name. The only one that mentions the book name was Ibn Abi Ya'la. He said this is from Shadow Sunnah. Ibn Taymiyyah didn't mention the book's name. Get that out there. And Al Dahabi didn't mention the book's name, but he quoted passages from it. So it could be that but Bahari wrote this in other books, potentially, and it's mafkud, it's lost. Do you understand? But I'm not saying that, just say for the sake of argument that Bar Bahari did write it. Let's just concede that, that Bar Bahari actually wrote this book. Then you have to accept the issues in the book. And if you say, no, Bar Bahari didn't write it, it was, there was some foul play by Ghulam Khalid the Dajjal of Baghdad or even Ibn Kamal who had, you know, who had self amazement and used to write from his own memory rather than from the book. Then it's dubious, isn't it? So you've got so many different reasons not to accept the book. But, and then you could take from if you want, if you want to scribe to, uh, to uh, Barbari, that's fine. Even al ibana Asul al-Diyana, they say, is, uh, is disputed. Even al ghunya uh, of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, they say, is disputed. So if you want to take from it, be my guest, take from it. But I presented ample evidence in two parts to show you that this book has got some issues. Do you understand what I mean? And I'm not saying that the whole book's got issues, but I'm saying, generally speaking, surrounding the book, there is some controversy. And we have to accept that the controversy is is real and there is hard proof and hard hard evidence to confirm it so again al barbahari gate is over uh for now again we'll see what you come back with and uh i'm sure there's ample evidence for my case and again you could just dis- just dis- dispute it or disregard it that's fine but you know i've got a point you know i've got valid grounds for my claims so that's for the that's the end of the video look after yourselves وصلى على نبينا محمد كم مرة عصف الأنين بداخلي كم مرة قدك قلبي من أسى حتى وكم كرهت مصابها لكن رأيت خير يسكب في أنا كم مرة قضقت من عظام البلى بشر وشيطان يحاصرني أبا كم مرة قد أظلم الدرب ضحى وتحدر الدمع وضاقت بي رؤى كم مرة عصف الأنكين بداخلي كم مرة قضاك كلبي من أسى حتى وكم كرهت مصابها لكن رأيت خير يسكب في أنا كم رأيت قضي